We are in Ezra chapter 7 through 10. And this is uh, interesting because we have a new person coming into town, into Jerusalem, and that is Ezra. Now, the book is named after him, right? And he wrote the book. But yet, we have to remember that chapters 1 through 6 uh, were 57 years before. There's a gap of 57 years between chapters 6 and 7. So Ezra was in Persia the whole time, 900 miles away. What was going on back in Jerusalem? Well, that was last week's study. They were building the temple, weren't they? Under Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. And remember how they knocked off for a while. They got discouraged. And who fired them back up? Who were those two prophets in the section of the minor prophets? One starts with an H, one starts with a Z. Close. You're, yeah, you're thinking of the New Year study. Yeah, yeah, close though. Haggai and, and Zechariah. And also what had happened... We don't get it for two books later, though. The book of Esther. The book of Esther, she's the queen, remember, in the Persian court. So um, this is already past, um, somewhat recent past. Now Ezra is coming, and it's like God is sending him because though the people have come back, 50,000 of them, years before, they've rebuilt the temple but they're getting lax spiritually. See, we all do that, don't we? We get all fired up. Maybe um, there's a project we're working on, we're all excited about it, but once it's over, it's like, oh, wow. You know, it's so easy to kind of drift. And we do that spiritually. So God's sending Ezra back to reform the people. And Ezra doesn't even really know. He doesn't even know what he's walking into. It wasn't like Nehemiah. We'll get that next week. Remember how they told Nehemiah, hey, things are messed up in Jerusalem. The walls are all broken down. And he starts just seeking the Lord, right? But Ezra, it doesn't really say that he knew too much. So let's jump right into it. Chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of, and it goes down the list, and he's connected all the way, verse 5, to Aaron, the chief priest. Isn't that something? Though he was not a chief priest, Ezra came up from Babylon, and that's the same as Persia. That's the old name uh, for that um, empire before Persia. Look at this. He was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses. He just was skilled. He just knew how to navigate through the word. And it means he's uh, prompt. He's quick. When it says he's a skilled scribe, he's, he's ready. And he is apt in business, really good at what he does. And we would kind of say today, he's pro. He's pro. You know, when you watch some, somebody do something with ease, you look at it and go, I can't do that. That is so pro, you know, and that's Ezra. Wouldn't it be great to be pro in the word? See, that's something we can all do. We can be pro in the word. How do you be pro in the word? You just read it, and then you go and study it, you know, go out with the body like we're doing right now. So it reminds me of uh, Apollos in Acts 18.24. It says, He was mighty in the scriptures. I love that. He was mighty in the scriptures. And he was sent to the Corinthian church to to teach him after Paul left. Man, I want to be like that. I want to be ready. A skilled scribe, ready. 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You know, we all get embarrassed, don't we? When we just don't know what to say to people. It's like, oh, I really don't know what the Bible says. But 
you know, we're growing, aren't we, in it? We, sometimes we get stumped, and that's all right. We just go, you know what, I don't know, but let me study it, and I'll get back with you. So we're sharpening our swords, aren't we? Every time we're sharpening our swords. Which the Lord God of Israel had given him, the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So he's requesting of uh, the king uh, to go back. Um, some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim. Remember the Nethanim, it's hard to say that, isn't it? Uh, these are the, uh, the servants, the uh, Gibeonites of old, who are the servants there in the temple, came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. Do the math. How many months? It was four months trekking 900 miles. No cars, trains, airplanes back then. You're walking. And we see that there, if we do the math as far as the men, and then we average in women and children, up to 5,000 people came back with Ezra. Not close to the 50,000 that came back with Zerubbabel and Joshua, you know, all those years earlier. But 5,000, so it would take four months to trek. That would be an average of seven miles per day. Doesn't seem like very much, does it? According to the good hand of his God upon him. And this is mentioned eight times in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. The phrase, the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. One of my favorite verses here in the book of Ezra. First of all, it says he prepared his heart to uh, seek the law, the law of the Lord. You know what that means? It means his heart was set firmly on it. He was inwardly determined. It's like a person this year going, you know what? I want to read my Bible this year. I slacked off last year. Enough of that. I want to uh, read my Bible this year. And so he's setting his heart on it. And then to do it, to do it. What does the Bible say about doing the word? Don't just be hearers of the word, but what? But be doers of the word. In James 1, 22 through 25. And then to teach it. To teach it. To give it out to others. Well, we have to admit that some people have a special gift of teaching. Ephesians 4, 11, God himself, he himself gave pastors and teachers. These are specially uh, gifted people to be able to explain the word of God to others for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But you might say, well, that's not my gift. But you know what? You can teach in a personal way to people one-on-one -on -one that you know, more in a casual, non-pro way, so to speak, you know? You can even say it that way. But uh, Psalm 34, 11 says, Come, you children, listen to me. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So that's one-on-one. -on -one. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And how about parents teaching their kids? Ephesians 6, 4, you fathers don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And that takes time, doesn't it, to teach the little ones. So we can teach. We might not be a scribe like Ezra, but we can know the word. In verse 11, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So it's really profiling Ezra as that skilled scribe. Artaxerxes, king of kings, you might say, well, hold on right there. Wait, I don't know about that. Only the Lord can hold that title. 
Well, before we get too picky about it, we know that it does say in Revelation 17, 14 and Revelation 19, 16 that Jesus is what? The King of kings and Lord of lords. Also in Daniel 2.37, it says, You, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, are a king of kings. You might go, well, what's that all about? Well, these were world empires. And there were little kings all over the empire. So in one sense, it's true. It's not puffing the guy up. He was king of kings. He was the main you know, guy, emperor, so to speak, leader, out of all the kingdoms of the earth, the main guy, the world leader, so to speak, was Artaxerxes here. He was king of kings, president of presidents, we would say, prime minister of prime ministers. And so it's a worthy title, as long as we don't, you know, take a title like that and just go, I'm so cool. You know, I'm the king of kings. You know, some people uh, have to have degrees after their name. It's like they can't live without it, you know. And um, it reminds me of that one pastor. This guy was very educated, but he had his um, uh, Bible degree up on the wall. And the Lord said, take it down. I don't want people looking at that. as They're sitting at your desk and looking over your shoulder at your Bible degree, you know. So he took it down and he put it in his file cabinet, you know. You know, we can just really get into these labels, right? Look who I am, you know. I'm this and I'm that. And, you know, it's good that if we're blessed with education and we've worked hard, that is great to have a title, but not, we don't need it to puff us up, do we? King of kings. No way, you know. And the Lord, he just, that belongs to him. To Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and so the seven counselors, probably the Supreme Court of the day. And whereas you are to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So the king is even giving an offering. And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people, and I love that, that's how we're to give to the Lord, is freely in our hearts, um, not under coercion by any means, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. So that's why we don't um, overemphasize tithing, uh, giving, because, you know, we just know the Lord speaks to our hearts and we give that free offering to the Lord. And that's the best way to give, isn't it? To give, uh, what does it say, uh, cheerfully and um, generously as unto the Lord. Now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. So he knew something about temple sacrifices. And whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. So man, he had like a, a blank check, didn't he? From the king. Also, the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full uh, before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Now, this is massive 
These are enormous amounts. I've spent some time uh, studying this, technically. I don't want to bore you with it. Sometimes in the back of your Bible, you have a page. It's called Bible Weights and Measures. And you can kind of, you know, look into it and get out a calculator and kind of, you know, do it yourself. It's amazing uh, what was offered here. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently uh, done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also, we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God, because they're serving the Lord and they have no other source of income. And you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, I like that. Um, If you're smart, it comes from the Lord, doesn't it? Set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. So Ezra, being a teacher, um, is given you know, carte blanche, the encouragement to go out and use his gift and set up others as well. You know, how important it is to educate the people. Tell them the word of God. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be by death, I don't know about that, (laughs) or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Doesn't say Ezra ever took that up you know it's like hey capital punish man if you don't uh, go to church you know if you don't serve the lord you know we could kill you well that'll pack the people in huh but i don't know if they'd want to be there <laughs> out of their own free will blessed be the lord god of our fathers. he now he's he's looking at this letter he reads it he's blown away he's so blown away by this letter blessed be the lord god of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. God put it in that king's heart. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. So the favor of the Lord and he has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged, I like this, as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. So how we need encouragement when things, you know, start going our way and the hand of the good hand of the Lord is upon us. Uh, we've, you know, have really gone forth in perseverance and diligence. And then God starts blessing. Uh, we would have to say that we're now encouraged as the hand of the Lord is upon us in that enterprise that he has uh, set us out to do. So we come to chapter 8. These are the heads of their father's houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me uh, from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. So, you know, my style, I don't really do all the genealogies. Is that okay to skip all um, all these here, most of them? Because it, it just goes on, and he's just talking about the total number of, of men. And all I can say is that, uh, uh, as I said before, there was up to 5,000. So technically, the total number of men here in this chapter uh, who returned, 1,514, including 18 heads of families and 1,496 other men. With the 258 Levites assembled later uh, in chapter 8, verse 15, the number came to 1,772. With women and children, the group may have totaled between 4,000 and 5,000. And another commentator says that it was 5,000. So I just kind of did some math for you uh, because sometimes we wonder, well, how do you pull that figure out of a hat or something? It's almost like when it says in the New Testament, Jesus fed the 5,000, but it says men. So if you add on women and children, you know, back then people had lots of kids. Then there could have been, Jesus could have fed between 15 and 20,000 people. So it says 5,000 men, 
but you add on a wife and kids, and you have scattered people who aren't married, you know, but combined all together, that's a lot of people. So this is kind of how we, we uh, guesstimate and come up with that figure in this chapter that 5,000 people returned with Ezra. Now, verse 15, I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days, all right? So he's gathering them together, and he's just checking everything out. You know, he's, he's not in a hurry. He's assessing everything. He's overseeing everything. And it says, I looked among the people. And that's a good heart, isn't it? He looked among the people. It's like Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And he didn't just see people. He saw individuals. And the priests, and found none of the sons of Levi there. So there's missing a bunch of Levites to serve the Lord. And it's like, where are they? And they stayed back in the comfort, didn't they, of the city. And he's now camping three days by the river of Ahava. And he's just taking inventory. He's going, we, we can't do this. How can we go back without proper Levites? Because what's back there is the temple, the rebuilt temple from Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest. And we can't go back. It's, we're going to be deficient in the ministry. We don't have the tools, the resources. I mean, what's the main thing? You've got to have the priests. You have to have the Levitical priests. So what does he do? He sent for Eliezer and all these guys, men of understanding, and I gave them a command for Ido, the chief man at the place, uh, Kaphia, and I told them what they should say to Ido and his brethren, the Nethanim at the place Kasaphia, that they should bring us servants for the house of our God. So it's like we got to go back and get servants of the Lord. We can't go on until we do. And then look at verse 18. Then by the good hand of our God upon us. See, we didn't have time this morning to, to study all eight phrases, but we're picking, up, picking them up now, aren't we? By the good hand of God. God just took care of it. When God's hand is upon you, the job's going to get done, man. And they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and brothers, 18 men, and Hashabiah, and with him, Jeshaiah, of the sons of Merari, his brothers and their sons, 20 men, and also the Nethanim, whom David and the leaders had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim, all of them were designated by name. So now it's amping up. Now God has provided, you know, the personnel, the workers, and they couldn't proceed until they recruited these men. So you know what I see in this? I see people who are reticent to step forward and serve Jesus Christ. They want to hold back in that comfort zone. And you know, the church can't progress until we have the laborers. We can't do anything like Ezra here. We can't go forward, I should say, until we have the, the people who are there to step out and say, you know what, I want to serve the Lord. And I don't want to be one of those who hold back. I don't want to be the weak link, the weak link, uh, wink, leak, <laughs> the whatever, <laughs> the person who slows down the church. I want to be um, right up there. I want to be in the vanguard out front, just serving the Lord. And let's just pray this year that we all step out and just serve the Lord and what he's called us to do. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones, the kids, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. So he boasted to the king, 
Ah, we don't need any escort, you know, and the Lord's going to protect us. Then he goes, uh-oh, you know, what did I say? You know, and now he's got to live out his faith. You ever do that? Where it's like, yeah, the Lord's going to take care of it. And then reality hits you. The next day it's like, what? <laughs> Lord, I'm totally on you. You're going to have to help me through this, you know. So they fasted and prayed, and, uh, you know, the Lord answered the prayer. Uh, you know, they were not attacked on the way. It was a dangerous road. It was 900 miles. You got the kids and the women. It's like those old westerns. You ever watch the old westerns? And you're, you're afraid, you know. They got the covered wagons and, and the, the prairie women, you know, and, and the kids and all that, and the donkeys and the cattle and, you know, John Wayne and whatever. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, they're vulnerable, but God protects us. And what do we call this? Traveling mercies. So was, we pray for each other. We pray for protection. Um, we started doing that because we were noticing people getting into accidents on the way to church. And I was like, wow, we got to pray against that. You know, we have to pray for uh, protection. And so w- we find that very often as we meet in our prayer corner before the service is, so often we will be led to pray, you know, for protection. And God has answered our prayers. Uh, we've seen it really, you know, go down that people are safe on the roads, you know, to and from, especially when it rains and the roads are slick. And each time that we go away and travel and go on vacation or whatever, uh, we say to each other, you know, pray for me. And it's a good prayer that God will give us his angels of protection. 24, and I separated 12 of the leaders of the priests and these guys uh, and 10 of their brethren with them and weighed out to them the silver, the gold, and the articles, look how specific Ezra is now. He's not just going, whatever, whatever. He's, he's just got the inventory going. He's got the clipboards out, uh, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who were present had offered. So he took it really seriously. You know, it's like doing a spreadsheet or something. And um, he wanted to make sure that he counted it all out on this side so when they went the 900 miles that they would have a uh, uh, proper you know reconciliation of that once they got there so i weighed into their hand 650 talents of silver silver articles weighing 100 talents 100 talents of gold 20 gold basins worth a thousand drachmas and two vessels of fine polished bronze precious as gold and i said to them you are holy to the lord the articles are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leaders of the priests and the Levites, heads of the fathers' houses of Israel in Jerusalem, in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites received the silver and the gold and the articles by weight to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. So they were being very fastidious with the accounting, which that's important, isn't it? The Bible says to do things honorable, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. So it's important that, you know, we look over uh, the things and, um, you know, that's God's precious money, isn't it? That's God's precious money. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem, and the hand of our God was upon us. There it is again. Man, the hand of the Lord is on the people, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the road. So we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. We're getting acclimated now. You imagine that picking up stakes, moving, taking you four months. You finally get there with your family. You know, it's like, wow, what do we do now? Where do we go? Where do we live? Now, on the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest, and with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. With them were the Levites, Jazabad, and the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui. With the number and weight of everything, all the weight was written down at that time. The children of those who had been carried away captive who had come from the captivity 
offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and 12 male goats as a sin offering. And this was a burnt offering to the Lord. And they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. So that letter, as were presented to the people of the land, and so they saw that these 5,000 were, were legit. They were sent by the king, and uh, therefore they were um, supported in their endeavors, even from their treasuries. Now, that's not all. <laughs> We've got, we just did two chapters here, right? And what's it all about? It's Ezra. We're profiling Ezra. He was in the word of God. He was already scribed, really emphasized. We saw the letter of the king. We saw Ezra praising the Lord. We rolled over into chapter 8, and we skipped all those genealogies. And we just did the math and said there's about 5,000 of them. And they fasted at the river for protection. And also, uh, they noticed the Levites that needed to, uh, to come forward, and they finally got them, and they can now you know, move on. Uh, they, they got there. Um, there's not a whole lot of information about the four months. It's not needed for the story. So why should the Bible talk about it, you know? And so they get there, and they, they do the final accounting, you know, the inventory. Nothing was missing out of the four months. No one stole the silver. No one stole the gold, you know. And it just shows that there's just really good, you know, accountability there uh, with the resources. And then... Chapter 9 and 10 now talks about Ezra, who will be teaching the word of God and reforming the people because a problem will come forth now. It will be predominant, and it will need to change. Things will need to change in the community of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem. So we roll into chapter 9. When these things were done, the leaders came to me, saying, now some time had gone on, which we'll see, and probably four months, okay, another four months, four months of travel, and now four months, maybe five months, that Ezra's back. And it's interesting, it says the people of, the leaders came to me, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, with respect to uh, with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians and the Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. Now, before we see Ezra flipping out about this, we want to discuss this. Um, What's the problem? The problem is they had married uh, the pagans of the land, the non-Jews. You weren't supposed to do that because it's very specific in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and following, Don't marry a non-believer. Marry a believer. Have that relationship with that person that, you know, you can seek the Lord together with, pray together with, and so forth. Serve God together. But they didn't do that. They were intermarrying with the pagans of the land. And see, Ezra comes and he starts teaching the word. I love this. Watch this now. He starts teaching the word. He's a skilled scribe. You know, we're just inferring that right away he starts teaching the word. because That's his gift. And the people needed a strong teacher of the word of God. Now, the word of God changes people's lives. Now, because of the word of God being taught for four to five months, which we'll see here in this, the math here coming up, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon the people. And the leaders came, verse 1, saying the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites 
you know, the spiritual leaders also got caught up on this or caught up in this. And, you know, it, it's not right because we're, we're listening to your Bible studies. And it's changing our lives. We're beginning to see that the word of God is true. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And man, does it convict and does it really give us that new mindset about life. And we can now distinguish between what is right and what is wrong because we're reading our Bibles and this is the truth. And it's cleansing us. And they're convicted. The leaders are going, we've done wrong. And see, this is what happens when we are immerse ourselves in the word of God on that continual basis. There will be that beautiful change going on inside of us, washed by the washing of the word. So now let's see Ezra flip out, okay? You want to see a good man flip out? You want to see a good leader? You know, almost have a coronary? Well, look at this. So when I heard this thing, check it out, you guys. Can you believe this verse? I tore my clothes. I tore my garment and my robe. That means his under shirt and his outer shirt as well. And look, and plucked out some of the hair of my head and my beard. Dude, that would hurt. And sat down astonished. He was stunned. Is that grieving or what? I mean, you know, sometimes you ever like done that where you just, you're so upset. Maybe you grabbed your hair and, or something like that. It's like, oh man, you know. But the Jews all wore beards, man. You know, I mean, nobody shaved. The Jew always had a beard. And you could just, and of course their hair was longer, you know. I didn't have super cuts of the day, you know. And so he's, he's just tearing his hair out. He tears his clothes. His undershirt, outer shirt. Then he pulls his hair out. Everybody's watching him. What's going on with Ezra, man? And he takes his beard. I think that would be the hardest thing because your, your nerves and your skin are so much, it's just, man, it's so sensitive. You know, I, can, I could probably do it up here because I'm kind of balding anyway. So what's the big deal, you know? But if I had a beard, you know, you were like, did your grandpa ever have a beard and grabbed his beard or something like that? You know, ouch, don't do that. You know, leave grandpa alone. And he sat down astonished. He was stunned. He just couldn't believe it. You know, and I love that about Brother Ezra because he just couldn't believe what the people were doing. And then everyone, verse 4, who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished, second time, astonished, until the evening sacrifice, or like, you know, late afternoon. And so he trembled. The people uh, who trembled at the word of the Lord, you know, got serious along with Ezra. And this is what we see here. We see seriousness about sin. The world doesn't take sin seriously. Okay, when you watch TV and, you know, Jerry Springer or these shows, you know, and and we've seen that one if, you know, the cheaters or whatever it's called. And, um, and you have the audience saying, you know, how many vote that you should leave the guy and how many vote that you should stay with the guy? And he's like, he's like cheating on her. It's called cheaters or something like that. I don't know what it's called exactly. And it's like, you just look at that and you just go, really? You're just, you guys are voting like that? And, and this whole premise of the show anyway. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Time to turn on Food Channel, I think. You know, something a little bit more, more easier and benign. But the people trembled at the word of the Lord. And it's good to have a healthy respect for God, isn't it? And his word. Isaiah 66, 2. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. And this is what we need today, is America to tremble at God's word. 
It could save our nation. It did save a great city, Nineveh. When Jonah preached, the people repented, see, at the preaching of the prophet Jonah. And we have to pray for our country. But let's pray for ourselves that we too would tremble at the word of God. And as we read it, we're going to be pricked in our, our conscience about certain things. And it's like, wow, Lord, you know, I need to change this. And the Lord says, you're not changing anything. I'm changing it. I'm changing it. Now, I showed you my word so that I can do the change in your life. Because we can't change ourselves, can we? No, because we always go back to the same old, same old thing, don't we? But when Jesus changes a life, he keeps you from going back. And that's what's cool about the Lord. Verse 5, at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting. And having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. He wouldn't even eat. They probably gave him a lamb burger or something, you know. Ezra, eat. No, I'm not going to eat. Man, we have to get serious about the Lord. And he falls on his knees and spreads out his hands to the Lord. And he said, this is a beautiful prayer. Oh, my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. Remember that story of that man, the parable from Jesus? There were two guys in the temple. One guy was proud, and the other guy couldn't even look up. He just beat on his chest saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Look at that. It's like water drowning him. And our guilt has grown up to the heavens. In other words, we're so busted, Lord. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, I like this, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, you know, the small minority that left Persia to come to Jerusalem and to give us a peg in this holy place, probably a reference to the temple being uh, rebuilt um, and like a firm nail, uh, the people in their worship were held up and, um, you know, borne up uh, with the strength of of that worship of the Lord, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. I love that. And that's what we need today, don't we? You know what revival is? Think of the word revive. It just means to come to life again. You know, it's kind of like a plant. We forgot to water. We came back from vacation. Uh Uh-oh. And I paid the neighbor boy. He did not water the plants very well, you know. And you put water on, what happens to it? It comes back to life. So when we have to be careful. Let's just kind of do a little thing with put our heads together on this. Does the world need reviving? No, because they're not born again. How can you revive something that hasn't been alive? See? So who needs reviving? The church. God's people have been born again. We have the life of Jesus, but sometimes that life kind of, you know, you have to feed it. You have to take care of it. You have to nurture your spiritual life. If not, it becomes like that plant. And you need reviving. Water of the word, nurture, coming back to Jesus. We thrive again. We were almost like, dead again, weren't we? But the Lord gave us mercy. We're thriving again. And this is revival. God's people coming alive again. Because usually we start out really on fire for the Lord, don't we? And then what happens kind of later on? All the stuff of life, you know, just hits you. Just left and right. All these responsibilities and trials and tribulations, you know. 
and you're, you're carrying a, a, a greater load than you used to. And sometimes you can cool off in your faith. It's like, oh, man, I'm tired. And I don't know how to deal with all this stuff. And we stop reading our Bibles. We fall off a of Bible study or fellowship, you know, just praising the Lord, giving the Lord the day. It's like we're just kind of letting that, that stuff go. And then it catches up with us. What do we need? We need revival. We need to get back to the Lord. We need to have that life again. And you know what? A lot of churches have a lot of, quote, life. But you know what it is? It's busy work. Remember the teachers used to give us busy work? And it wasn't real work at school. You have all this activity in the church. People say, oh, the church is filled up and revival is going on. No, you just have a bunch of activity. You know, bowling for Jesus. You did bowling for dollars, now it's bowling for Jesus. And now you got all this stuff and this entertainment and you got all these activities and stuff. But like the church of Sardis in Revelation 3, you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. You need reviving. And nothing can do it except bringing the Bible back into our lives. And so may God give us a measure of revival in the church today. Verse 9, for we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage. But he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And you might say, well, wait a minute. If Nehemiah comes afterward, what do you mean a wall? Well, it could be like uh, some of the little walls around. Um, the major wall will be rebuilt under Nehemiah. Or it could just mean a wall of protection. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands with their abominations, which have filled it from one end of another uh, with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance uh, to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us, for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Do I hear an amen on that? Isn't God merciful? You know, you think about it, that God does uh, punish us less than our iniquities deserve. You know, when we, when we blow it. But God's so merciful. Romans 2, 4, the kindness, goodness of God leads us to repentance. You know, and we feel like Peter just falling before Jesus, saying, I'm not worthy, Lord, when the Lord gave Peter all that fish, you know. And he just says, Lord, I'm not worthy. Depart from me. But God punishes us far less than our iniquities deserve. And he extends mercy and grace as long as we give it all to him and say, Lord, I'm a mess. I'm messed up. And I need to put you back in my life. Psalm 103, verse 10, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. So I like that as well. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O oh, Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. So he's saying, Lord, you didn't bring us out of Egypt and back, you know, from Persia to rebuild the temple that we would just blow it, you know? It's not why you, you did that, Lord. And this is how we feel, right? God does such a great work in our lives, and, and then we blow it. We fall short. And don't we feel bad? afterward because it's like after all that Jesus has done for me and I've messed it up I blew it 
I dropped the ball, man, on the Lord. And I never thought I would do it, but I did it. And this is how Ezra feels right here. And we can identify with that for sure. Now, our last chapter, chapter 10, while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God, he was just, I call that carpet time, (laughs) when we get down before the Lord on the floor. A very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. And I love this. One person can spark a revival. Don't tell me it can't happen that way, because it can. Ezra, his heart for the Lord, his seriousness about sin, about holiness and righteousness, and his weeping for the people and his prayers of intercession and supplicating for mercy had a direct effect on the people. Now the people are crying. Because before, they were probably just like, whatever, this is just what we do. Ezra's back, and he's all, like, you know, into it, you know. And, you know, and and they're watching Ezra, you know, his beard's missing, and his hair's out over here, and his toes are all clump, or torn, and, and he's down on the ground. And, you know, he's praying and putting his hands up like this. And, and, and he's still down there, you know. And, and the people come to him. And they're getting conviction. They're getting conviction for their sin. And they're weeping bitterly. So it's happening, man. And if you study revivals, the history of revival, this is what you're going to see. People are sorry for their sins. And they break down and they want change. They want change. And so Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam spoke up and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Well, there's an optimistic guy. (laughs) I like him. He said, Ezra, you know, there's hope for us. Ezra didn't even say that, but this guy did. You know, he's kind of, he knows about the mercy of the Lord, see, Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who had been born to them, according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. It's like, bro, Ezra, you know, we appreciate you, and and we're changing, and we want to do what's right, but, you know, you you, got to get up, man. You got to um, help us now in a practical way uh, on how to, to do this. So we also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. So they're encouraging Ezra to follow through now with the practicality of what they need to do to put away their pagan wives and children. Then Israel arose, or Ezra arose, and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word, So they swore an oath. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God. He's like, okay, let's do it. And went into the chamber of Jehohanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water. For he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. So he didn't go to In-N-Out Burger, you know, all of a sudden just go, oh, I'm hungry, you know. He was still mourning for the sins of the people until this thing was resolved. And so, God bless them, man. You know, we need people like that. We need good shepherds, people with a heart uh, for the Lord. And they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the descendants of the captivity that they must gather at Jerusalem and that whoever would not come within three days, according to the instructions of the leaders and elders, all his property would be confiscated and he himself would be separated from the assembly of those from the captivity. They would just take your house. Talking about foreclosure, man. You know, they would just take the house and you would be banished from society. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. Yeah. And, you know, the seriousness of it. 
and losing their houses and all that. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the month, and all the people sat in the open square of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of heavy rain. So they were trembling. It's like, oh, they started feeling so bad, and it's good. It's good when we feel bad, you know, for our sins. And they're kind of like shaking. And that's what we do when we start repenting. We feel bad and we're very broken in our spirits. And sometimes it affects our bodies, taking that trembling, that kind of lowly posture. But it was also raining very hard, too. And so they were freezing and they were trembling for both reasons. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from pagan, the pagan wives. You know, now what is this? If a person says, Oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. I've been smoking pot. You know, well, if you're really going to repent, what are you going to do? Stop smoking pot. (laughs) You're going to get rid of it. They had pagan wives. And now they're going to get rid of their pagan wives. That's huge, isn't it? Is that easy to do? No, you've been living together, you know, the whole thing. And it's not easy to do. But it shows true repentance means that we change, that we change, that we're not the same person, that we're going to stop doing what we've done before. That's bringing us down. Then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, yes, as you have said, so we must do. But there are many people, it is the season for heavy rain, and we are not able to stand outside, nor is this the work of one or two days for there are many of us who have transgressed in this matter. So it became a practical thing to um, kind of administrate this thing. So um, please let the leaders of our entire assembly stand and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times together with the elders and judges of their cities until the fierce wrath of our God is turned away from us in this matter. So Ezra did not have, you know, that administrative gift, all right? He's like a teacher, and he's got a burden for the people, and he's praying for the people. That was his gift. He really didn't know what to do practically with this situation. But see, a couple of these guys came forward and said, you know, we should do this, we should do that, and that's the gift of administration, organization, and certain people have that gift. I uh, think it's First Corinthians twelve. Is it like is it twenty nine? I think where it talks about administrations. It means the helmsman of a ship. People just say, "I know what to do," and they grab the helm, or we would say steering wheel today. And we should do it this way. It's like, oh, I'm so glad you came forward because I, I don't know what to do, in that practical way. So the Lord raises people up who have this gift. And can kind of like organize things. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jeaziah, the son of Tikva, opposed this. And Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, gave them support. So only four guys said, no, 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 we shouldn't do that, and, and so forth. You know, there's always people that will say, no, 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 just almost for the sake of no, no, no. But um, the majority said, no, we're going to do this. Then the descendants of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest, with certain heads of the father's households, were set apart by the father's households, each of them by name, and they sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. By the first day of the first month, they finished questioning all the men who had taken pagan wives. So they just kind of came up, you know, one by one and laid their their case down, tried to resolve these things. And among the sons of the priests who had taken pagan wives, and that's sad, isn't it? Because, you know, spiritual leaders are supposed to be an example. But here, they were taking pagan wives as well. 
you know? And it says, you know, in the, in the word, uh, Hosea 4.9, it says, like people, like priests. That's not good. It should be like priests, like people, you know? The priests were following the people, or they could have even, you know, set that whole uh, uh, bad example, and the people followed them. So there's greater responsibility on their part. <clears throat> the following were found of the sons of Jeshua and these people, verse 19, and they gave their promise that they would put away their wives. And being guilty, they presented a ram of the flock as their trespass offering. So they're doing it. They are uh, proving themselves uh, true in their repentance. Second Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Don't just cry crocodile tears. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you may suffer, that you may suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly matter, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. True repentance is a changed life. Don't just say you're going to do it. Go out and do it with God's help. I like Zacchaeus. Remember when he came to the Lord? Luke 19, 8. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusations, I restore fourfold. Verse 20, also some of the sons of um, these guys, and we just go on through. There's plenty of names there. And you know what? We're done. <laughs> oh, this 44, I guess. All these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. So, you know what? Nehemiah's going to come along, and the same thing is going to happen later on during Nehemiah's day. They're going to take pagan wives, and Nehemiah, we're going to pick this up, you know, the next couple of weeks, Nehemiah is going to freak out and have his conniption too, but instead of, instead of pulling out his beard, he does it to the people. <laughs> he pulls out their hair. And he, he curses at them. Not cussing. But he says, the curse of the Lord be upon you. And, and he just gets down on them. So you've got Ezra doing it to himself. And Nehemiah saying, what are you guys doing, man? You know, this is such a bad sin. We've, we've done this so long. Why do we keep doing this? Being unequally yoked together with non-believers. You know, worldly. So next week, book of Nehemiah. Father, we just thank you for this evening's Bible study. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Ezra the man who knew the word. He studied it. He did it. And he taught it. The people responded. Conviction came. Lives were changed and turned around for the Lord because of the teaching of God's word. Lord, we thank you for your word that goes out from our church and from our lives because we're in it, Lord. We don't just come and listen. We'll also go home and read our Bibles too this week. And we ask, Lord, for a revival to break out according to the word of God. We just pray, Lord, that it would change us, that it would cleanse us, Lord. It would make us new in this new year. What a year ahead of us. What worthy goal to have. I want to be like Jesus. I want revival in my life. Cause it to be, Lord. Only you can do it. Give us a measure of revival, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let it begin with us, Lord, because we surely can't change anybody else. And so we just pray that together you would hear our prayer. And Lord, that we would come away from the curse of compromise and that we would just be wedded to you, just 
you would be our all in all, Lord. You would be our first love. That we wouldn't stray and think that we need the things of this world. Would you just keep us, Lord? Guard us. Keep us close to you in the evil world that we see out there, Lord. Scary, Lord. But yet, we're not scared because we have you. You're walking with us. You're protecting us. You're holding our hand, Lord. You're by our side. And the good hand of the Lord is upon us. Protect your people. Bless them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.